Good afternoon, folks. Uh, it's 4.01, uh, so I'd like to get started. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, who is our own, Professor Mike Litos. Uh, Professor Litos was an undergrad at Michigan State, graduating in 2003, before earning his PhD from Boston University, in, actually in the area of high energy physics, and then later he branched into accelerator-based plasma physics with a position at SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, first as a postdoc, and then as a staff scientist through, through uh, 2016. Uh, Mike joined the CU Physics Department in 2016, where he's built up an experimental program on laser, pro laser plasma interactions with applications for next generation accelerators, which we'll hear about in this talk. Uh, Mike was part of a team that was awarded a breakthrough prize in fundamental physics in 2016 for his uh, super Kamiokande and T2K collaboration. He's won an NSF Career Award in 2020, and he's given invited talks all around the world on his current work on advanced accelerator concepts. Uh, we're honored to have him here today speaking on uh, extending the energy frontier and democratizing X-ray lasers. So please join me in welcoming Mike Litos. Thank you. R really important correction to make there. Uh, SLAC used to stand for the Stanford Linear oh. Accelerator Center. But now it's no longer an acronym. It is the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. So <laughs> I won't take offense, Tobin, to your ignorance. <laughs> OK. So uh, thank you all. So um, first of all, of course, uh, before doing anything else, I want to give credit to my students who really do all the hard work, and I just get to take the credit. So uh, my PhD students have included Robert Arnello, Chris Doss, Keenan Hunstone, Valentina Lee, and Claire Hansel. So the, Ones with asterisks next to their name are my current lab members. The others have graduated. And my undergraduates throughout the years, who are many in number, Matt Guerrero is my current undergraduate still working in our lab. Here are some pictures of our group throughout the years. You can see the progression of the group makeup and size and also the length of my hair pre and post COVID. And of course, give credit to our funders, our uh, our research funding comes from the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. They keep the lights on in the lab and food in the mouths of my grad students. So uh, this talk is going to have three main sections. First, I'm going to talk about plasma wake field acceleration, uh, just give an introduction to the topic so you can understand what it's all about. And then getting into the target applications for this research, extending the ener energy frontier with future particle colliders, and then democratizing X-ray lasers uh, with X-ray free electron lasers. Um, these are devices based on relativistic electrons to produce high brightness X-ray laser pulses. So first, plasma wake field acceleration. OK, so some of the fundamental concepts. First, before even talking about plasmas, I want to just talk about the concept of smaller length scales correlating to higher energy scales. This is probably a concept familiar to pretty much everyone here, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page especially in terms of some of these energy scales to give you some specific, though very rough estimates. If I want to talk about probing matter at sort of the atomic scale, I need photons or particles at the energy of electron volts or kilo electron volts going deeper into the nucleus. That's roughly speaking mega electron volt scale and going even deeper, GeV scale for quarks and fundamental partons. And to probe, search for, continue the search for beyond the standard model physics. Maybe we need to go even higher to the 10 multi TeV or to the TeV or 10 dV scale. Hopefully, we'll find it there, perhaps higher. So now I just want to talk about some really fundamental concepts in particle acceleration that are not necessarily always familiar with everyone in terms of the jargon we use. So um, this should be a very simple cartoon everyone can follow. Imagine I have a battery with two electric plates just large capacitor plates, and uh, they have a uh, voltage difference of one volt. And I place an electron on one side. It's going to be accelerated from one side to the other. A one volt potential will increase the electron's energy, its kinetic energy, by one electron volt over the length of the gap. Pretty obvious. So if my gap length is one meter, I would say the accelerating gradient is one electron volt per meter. Okay, So this is the, this is the term I might use again the accelerating gradient. This is the energy gain per unit distance. Pretty fundamental concept. So hopefully we're all on the same page now. So let's talk about how conventional particle accelerators work. This is um, a photograph of uh, a conventional copper 
radio frequency particle accelerator at SLAC where they've cut it open so you can see what the insides look like, um, sort of a museum display uh, piece. And the idea is that we couple in uh, high power microwaves or RF waves into one of these couplers. They flow through the structure and produce this alternating, um, alternating longitudinal electric field structure inside the center of this structure. There's a hole drilled down the center of it, if you can't see. It's called an iris loaded waveguide. Down the center, the electric field alternates in direction from moving to, uh, pointing to the right or pointing to the left. And I've color coded them so you can see a little bit more easily. And as the RF wave travels through the structure, you can see that the uh, uh, direction of the electric field alternates in each cell. So if I send an electron bunch through this uh, accelerating, uh, accelerating waveguide and time it right, it will follow along with the field that is pointing in the direction to accelerate my, in this case, electrons. So if we want to have higher accelerating gradient, in principle all we need to do is just increase the electric field strength inside of these waveguides, which is possible to do to a certain point. At some point, when we reach electric fields on the order of 100 megavolts per meter, which would correspond to 100 MeV per meter accelerating gradient, it begins to break down the structure. We get these tiny little pock marks on the surface of the copper, and it can no longer sustain the fields. And that sets sort of a fundamental upper limit to the accelerating gradient of conventional particle accelerators, 100 MeV per meter. So can we exceed this limit if our accelerating structure is already broken down, like in the case of a plasma? It's just ionized gas, after all. You can't do much more to it to damage it. The answer is obviously yes, since I wouldn't be here talking about it if that weren't true. So, here is a cartoon demonstrating the concept of the so-called laser wake field accelerator. This is the same thing as the plasma wake field accelerator. It's driven by a laser pulse. But the original name for this was the laser wake field accelerator. It was the title of a paper by uh, John Dawson, a renowned plasma physicist, and his uh, postdoc at the time, Toshi Tajima. Uh, in 1979, they wrote a paper called the laser wake field accelerator, and it really kicked off an entire field of research. It's pretty interesting, sort of a little unique, I think, in the area of uh, physics to have one paper spur, you know, an, uh, spur off an entire field of research. Um, the idea is basically represented entirely in this cartoon. I have an intense laser pulse. It's traveling through maybe some neutral gas, and the very front of the laser pulse is strong enough to ionize the gas out in front, creating this plateau of fully ionized gas, so a plasma formed ahead of the main part of the laser pulse. And then at the main part of the laser pulse, the ponderer motive force from this laser pulse kicks around the plasma electrons. So it's also, of course, going to interact with the ions, but the ions being far more massive, at least 2,000 times more massive than my electrons, uh, their response time is much, much slower. So on the time scale of these waves that are going to be produced, these density waves produced in the plasma, we can essentially think of only the plasma electrons moving in response to the laser. It's a pretty good approximation of what's happening. So we're making these plasma density waves or electron density waves behind my driving laser pulse. I could, instead of using a laser pulse, use a uh, bunch of electrons like I would have in a particle accelerator and send that through the plasma. It would do the same thing. And in fact, we do that. The wake phase velocity then, following behind this laser pulse, is basically equal to the uh, group velocity of my driver, which is about the speed of light. And uh, if I put a relativistic electron bunch behind my driver in the correct phase of this wake, it can be accelerated by the longitudinal wake field created by this plasma density wave. And it turns out with plasma densities easily accessible in the laboratory, we can get accelerating gradients up to 100 GeV per meter. So that's 1,000 times stronger than that upper limit I said in conventional RF based accelerators. So this is an extremely enticing idea. Um, the problem was in 1979, it wasn't possible to make the laser pulses that could do this. But with the uh, advent of chirp pulse amplification, which won the Nobel Prize in 2018, I think, uh, we could start producing those laser pulses and get those um, 1,000 times greater accelerating gradients in plasma accelerators. So here's a cartoon kind of demonstrating the principle. I have my plasma, some intense laser pulse propagates through the plasma, and it creates this laser-driven plasma wake behind it. It's kind of analogous to when I have an intense duck traveling through the water. And it creates a wake behind it on the surface of the water here. 
And what's important here is that the um, macroscopic structure of this wake remains more or less constant as the duct travels through the water, and the same thing when my laser travels through the plasma. The individual particles are different at any given point in space, but the overall structure remains kind of quasi-static. Here's a simulation, a uh, particle and cell simulation, of a laser propagating through a plasma. We can see the plasma electron density in this kind of white gray scale, and we can see the wake structure, a more realistic depiction of the wake structure behind the laser. So the plasma is not actually like the surface of water. It's not uh, that we have a laser traveling on the surface of some pool of plasma, but depicting these three-dimensional things is a little bit tough. Rather, look at this picture down here and rotate it about the propagation axis to get the three-dimensional picture in your head. It's more like a bubble structure following behind the laser. And again, don't take this picture too literally. But the idea here now is, OK, I've created the wake. What am I going to do to accelerate the bunches? It's analogous to when I have a wake border behind a boat sitting at the right phase of the wake behind the boat. It's going to be accelerated. And as long as they remain phase locked behind that boat, they'll continuously be accelerated. The same thing will happen with my bunch of electrons. If they're relativistic, they'll be traveling roughly the speed of light following behind my wake driver, which corresponds to the boat. And my accelerated particles, the surfer, will get an energy gain. So this wake structure remains quasi-static during the propagation throughout the entire duration of the plasma. And my relativistic electron bunch is going to surf or be accelerated in the right phase of the wake. OK, so getting a bit more quantitative uh, with our uh, graphic representations now. Here is a uh, numerical calculation of uh, what I'm going to show are going to be the density and the longitudinal and transverse wakes when I have a plasma wake field accelerator in the linear regime. So this is where my, in this case, electron bunch is going to be driving the wake. It's propagating to the right in this image. And uh, we call that the z direction. So my wake driver is an electron bunch. We see the density pattern of it here. And I can calculate the perturbation of the density of the plasma with this formula here in this linear regime. So when the density perturbation is small, it's very easy to model using kind of classic uh, fluid type plasma modeling. And we see in here, there's this sine function. And it tells us that we get this sinusoidal-like perturbation of the density in the plasma behind my driver. And that's what we see down here. This is the plasma electron density following the driver. And if I do a line out, I can see the sinusoidal function and the density. So from that, we can calculate using an electrostatic picture of the waves. We can calculate the longitudinal electric field and the transverse electric field. So these are the fields that are going to be affecting any kind of second electron bunch I might want to load into my plasma wake to be accelerated. They're also affecting this drive bunch as well, but we're not going to worry about that at the moment. So we see here they also have this cosine and sinusoidal-like pattern. So first we look at the longitudinal wake structure. So this is the EZ, the longitudinal electric field, how it appears um, in response to this wake driver moving to the right. And we see again this kind of uh, sinusoidal-like pattern. However, we notice this one actually goes like a cosine. So we have a 90-degree phase shift with respect to the density perturbation of the plasma. And if we look at the transverse fields, so this is the EX field. We can see that what it's doing is at each different um, half period, I have electric fields either pointing outward away from the central axis, I guess that's actually here, or inward toward the central axis. So red is negative, uh, blue is positive. So here I have upward pointing electric field, downward pointing electric field, downward and upward with respect to you know, the uh, uh, projector screen here. So uh, I can take a line out of these different fields. And now, given that structure, I want to ask myself, where would I put my trailing bunch to accelerate it? I want it to be in a phase of the wake that's accelerating. So it means negative electric field. Point, the electric field's pointing backward. They're negatively charged electrons. So they're accelerated forward in that case. And I need it to be uh, outward pointing electric field transversely, which will be focusing for my negatively charged electron bunch I'm going to accelerate. So we can find this phase in the wake that's ideal for loading a trailing bunch. Now, it turns out the linear regime is nice because we can model it very easily. It works pretty well. But it's actually not as ideal as uh, the nonlinear regime for accelerating our particles. So as we increase the density of my drive bunch, I start going from the linear regime to the quasi-nonlinear regime, and eventually all the way to the highly nonlinear regime. 
This is when the density of my bunch is much greater than the density of the plasma. This could also be achieved when the intensity of my, the normalized intensity of my laser um, is much greater than one in normalized relativistic units. But it doesn't matter. When the intensity of the laser gets much stronger, I can also reach this highly nonlinear regime. So here's a bit more of a precise picture of what that looks like in a simulation. This is called the nonlinear blowout regime. So we can see why in a moment. It, in this picture, I have a drive bunch, a witness bunch, and they're moving to the right. So let's label the anatomy of our wake structure here. So I have my drive beam here. It's moving to the right through the plasma. The purple is the density of the plasma electrons. The density of this drive bunch is so strong, it actually expels all of the plasma electrons from this bubble-like region behind it in the wake. And then what's left behind, uncolored in this image, in this black void, are just the ions. So we presume the ions remain more or less at the same uh, static density that they had prior to the arrival of the drive beam. And then finally, we can load in our trailing beam, the witness beam, we sometimes call it, to be accelerated in the bunch, or in the wake. So this, again, simultaneously focuses and accelerates our trailing bunch. And those are very attractive properties. And in this highly nonlinear regime, it turns out that um, there are some special properties that are unique that make it more ideal for accelerating our bunch. So let's look at the same kind of images we showed before of some calculations of the density of my plasma in response to my drive bunch. So now we can see this uh, characteristic blowout structure, this void where there are no plasma electrons left behind. And this leads to a longitudinal field structure that now looks like this. It's not this nice, well, it wasn't a very simple sinusoidal like uh, pattern that we saw before. Instead, what we see is that the electric field, the longitudinal electric field, depends on the local radius of the blowout and the slope of the radius of the blowout at that point along the longitudinal dimension. So it has a longitudinal dependence. In the front, it's decelerating. In the rear, it's accelerating for negatively charged electrons. And interestingly, you'll notice that it has no dependence on the transverse position within the blowout. Now, if we look at the transverse electric field, we see that it has uh, dependence on the radial position, the transverse position, but no dependence on the longitudinal position. And in fact, it's linear with R. So this is different than in the so-called linear wake field regime. So the longitudinal field is independent of the transverse position, and the transverse field is independent of the longitudinal position, and it's linear, linear in R. These are very, very convenient uh, features to have. This behaves much more like a conventional accelerating structure. And it, it allows us to preserve the quality of our electron bunch by positioning it where we need it to be in the wake and, um, and not increasing the emittance, which is a property I'll talk about later on in this talk. So here's a photograph of an actual working plasma accelerator. This is actually from Berkeley National Lab, uh, where they have um, a sapphire block where they drilled a hole down the center and fed in uh, some hydrogen gas through the middle and then had an electrical discharge. There are electrodes on either end. It really was pretty much literally lightning in a bottle. They shot a laser in from left to right through the central hole. The whole thing has about a 10 centimeter length and uh, accelerated electrons from rest to 10 GeV in 10 centimeters. The equivalent conventional accelerator using standard RF technology would be over 10 meters long. So this is a good demonstration of uh, the fact that this, this, this stuff really works, really exists. We have photographic proof. OK, so now let's talk about uh, kind of the, the big uh, obvious application for this kind of thing, which is looking at the energy frontier in particle physics. Uh, particle physics relies heavily on particle colliders to explore uh, the high energy frontier. Again, looking, thinking back to the first slide, these ultra-small spatial scales, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so the question is, what's next in the energy frontier? The Higgs boson was discovered many years ago now at ATLAS and CMS at the LHC. So what's next? Uh, I don't know if I would say necessarily there's a total consensus, but I would say there's probably a majority opinion that the next machine should be a lepton collider. So the LHC is a uh, hadron collider, which means that you have particles, uh, protons, that are made of constituent particles, partons, quarks, gluons. And so when you collide these protons together, it's really the individual quarks and maybe more often gluons that are colliding with each other. And because each one of those partons carries a different fraction of the momentum of the overall proton, 
the center of momentum energy of the collisions has a very large spread. So you get these kind of messy collisions. You also get lots of QCD backgrounds that are not so interesting necessarily to study. So if I collide leptons, like electrons and positrons, well, all of my electrons that I accelerate have a very precise fixed energy. Same thing with my positrons. And so when I collide them, I know I'm going to have a very clean and precise center of momentum energy. I'm going to have lower backgrounds. I can even have polarized beams with high control of the polarization. And there's a historical precedence for this. So at the SPS at CERN in 1981, the Z boson was discovered. And that was followed up by the only linear collider so far constructed and operated in uh, the late 80s for about a decade at SLAC. That was the SLAC linear collider. Uh, and they did precision studies of the Z boson. So there's this model that has worked in the past and might be followed in the future. The physics goals of the next machine then would be precise measurements of, say, the Higgs mass, its width, its spin, C and P numbers, couplings to the uh, electro electroweak bosons, leptons, quarks, self-coupling of the Higgs fields, et cetera. So there is um, a very mature technical design report for a few possible options, including one called the International Linear Collider. This is maybe the leading contender, perhaps. This is an electron-positron collider. It uses superconducting conventional LINAX to accelerate the particles. And it's been in the work for decades, decades. And there's still no clear future for this thing. Here's a cartoon mock-up of it. You can see it's 31 kilometers long. Um, if it were to be anywhere, it might be in Japan. But Japan has been reluctant to commit to that. Um, so very recently, in fact, this year, we came up with the most recent conceptual, very, very conceptual design for a plasma-based collider to try and understand how could we put our plasma-based um, accelerators uh, to work in accelerating particles for a future collider. So this is a new design from this year. The idea is to use a conventional accelerator to create positrons at 31 GeV. That's because we still have a lot of trouble accelerating positrons with plasma-based accelerators. I don't have time to talk about it. It's a very interesting topic, but it's a challenge. Electrons, we understand. Positrons are tough. But we would use plasma accelerators to accelerate electrons up to 500 GeV. So this would be an asymmetric collisions of 31 GeV on 500 GeV, which is maybe not ideal. However, when we look at the spatial scale of this thing, it's about 3.3 kilometers long. And the asymmetry seems to be uh, low enough that it could still be uh, pretty useful for uh, particle physicists. But this is very much a design in the works. I just wanted to give you an idea as to where might this go in the future. In this cartoon, you can see this little section right here. These are all 16 of the plasma accelerator stages. So in fact, interestingly, the majority of this 3.3 kilometers is the magnetic delivery system, the focusing system that is needed to deliver these electrons uh, to the collider target at the end and have a small enough spot size at the collision point. The accelerators are almost the smallest part of the entire thing, which is not true at all for the ILC. And in fact, when we, combine, when we compare them, it's an order of magnitude reduction in size. So you can see the potential attraction for trying to build something like this. It might mean that instead of kicking a can down the road, uh, for decades and decades, perhaps it might actually get built. But you know, I'm biased. So um, what are the demands for a collider? If we want to use a plasma-based accelerator to uh, actually uh, collide particles for high energy physics purposes, we need to have high accelerating gradient. That's been demonstrated at a few facilities. So over here, I'm going to list the facilities. And this is not really an exhaustive list, but some uh, more famous demonstrations. The FFTD was a facility at SLAC National Laboratory. FACET was a facility at SLAC National Laboratory. I worked at FACET before coming here. Acceleration of individual bunches of electrons, that's been demonstrated at flat FACET and then at Flash Forward, which is a plasma wake field accelerator facility uh, at DAISY in Germany. Accelerating with high efficiency. Staging, so this means coupling particles out of one plasma accelerator stage and into the next. So this has only been done with laser-driven wake field acceleration so far. Uh, my area of research and this collider design is really based on electron bunch driven, particle driven plasma wake field accelerators. So this has been demonstrated, but still needs to be done with a electron beam driven plasma accelerator. This was done at uh, Berkeley National Labs Bella facility. 
preserving the emittance or the quality, the transverse quality of the bunch. We'll talk about that a bunch more in a moment. That's been demonstrated at Flash Forward and Spark Lab, which is at INFN in Italy. Energy spread minimization. So when the bunch is accelerated at the end, I want all my particles in the bunch to have almost exactly the same energy. So the spread in energy should remain low, preferably 1% or lower. And high repetition rate. Uh, so that's also been demonstrated. Now the thing is, all of these things have been demonstrated, but they've all been done kind of as one-offs, individually, one at a time, maybe two at a time in some cases, but never all together. And we need all of them done together for this to work in a collider. And so roughly speaking, that is the mission of the FACET2 facility at SLAC, which is where my research program is really centered. So the FACET2 facility is a plasma wakefield acceleration research facility at SLAC National Laboratory, not an acronym. And uh, you can see an overhead aerial photograph of SLAC lab. Here is the long linear accelerator. Uh, it's, it's three kilometers long. The middle kilometer is the FACET facility. Uh, the third kilometer is for the LCLS X-ray free electron laser. And the first kilometer is now the just starting to be commissioned LCLS2 X-ray free electron laser. Here's a photograph of the experimental area at the very end of our FACET2 accelerator facility. So some quick specs. It's a one kilometer long LINAC. It has a new photo injector, so it can produce high quality electron bunches. Uh, it accelerates them to 10 GeV energy per particle by the time it gets to the experimental area with about two nanocoulombs per bunch. It's a lot of particles. It's a very high density bunch. Uh, 10 kiloamps peak current per bunch and at 10 hertz repetition rate. Uh, emittances are in the order of five millimeters milliradians. Main point is that's a very high quality, relatively high quality, uh, which is very good for these kinds of demonstrations of application readiness. And we can send in one or two bunch beams from the main Linux. So I can send in a single bunch or a structure where I have a drive bunch and a trailing bunch where the drive bunch drives the wake and the trailing bunch is accelerated. So the goals are basically what I've laid out trying to show simultaneously high energy transfer efficiency, emittance preservation, energy spread minimization, minimization, all these things simultaneously at high energy where we'd like to double the energy of the incoming trailing bunch from 10 GeV to 20 GeV in a single meter scale plasma accelerator. And this, Luminosity isn't really a meaningful quantity for this thing, but I would say, you know, what's meaningful is two nanocoulombs per bunch, or maybe the witness bunch is one nanocoulomb, um, one nanocoulomb with this emittance. Uh, so that's, it's not collider quality beam, it's approaching it, is the way I'd answer that. Um, so, uh, uh, and I wanted to say that, uh, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Let's go on. So emittance, this is, this is sort of uh, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges, uh, preserving the beam emittance. So emittance is basically the volume occupied by my beam in phase space, in transverse phase space. So here I've got plotted a bunch of little blue points that represent the individual particles in my electron bunch. And it's plotted on these axes. So this is the x position of every individual particle where I'm looking at my beam head on, you might say. But instead of plotting the y position of my particles, I'm plotting x prime along the vertical axis. So this is the angle that the particles make with respect to the z axis in the xz plane. So you could think of this as being approximately px over pz, x momentum over the z momentum in this paraxial picture where all my particles are traveling nearly straightforward with very small angles with respect to the propagation axis. Um, I can make a similar plot for the y transverse phase space. It would look very similar. So the typical beam can be described by this ellipse. If I look at all of my particles collectively, I can draw an ellipse that contains a certain percentage of them. And then I can just talk about how does the ellipse evolve and it becomes a lot easier to describe how that ellipse evolves rather than keeping track of a billion particles at once. And the emittance of my bunch is effectively then just the area of this ellipse. So this ellipse rotates continuously while it's inside of my plasma, or really when it's inside of my plasma wake due to the Coulomb focusing force of that ion channel, that void inside of the plasma bubble. We call this motion betatron oscillation. So if I were to draw how this ellipse evolves as it's traveling through my plasma wake field accelerator, it's just rotating about at a constant rate um, as drawn here. Okay. 
Now, the primary driver of emittance growth, degradation of my transverse beam quality, is chromatic phase spreading during this betatron oscillation. So it's called filamentation in the accelerator world. So imagine if I take my bunch and I divvy up all the particles and I make new ellipses where they're color coordinated based on the energy of the particles. Some of my particles might have 1% higher energy. Some particles might have the exact mean energy. Some might have 1% lower energy than the mean. And I can color coordinate those ellipses. And the ones with higher energy have a higher inertia, and they're going to effectively rotate more slowly in this transverse phase space. The focusing is going to create a slower betatron oscillation for the higher energy particles compared to the lower energy particles. And so over time, they're going to spread out in transverse phase space. So what this means then is after many betatron periods, after it's rotated around many times, all the different uh, energy slices of my beam are going to be spread out. I've got this chromatic phase mixing, and the projected area of my beam now becomes this new large circle in this case. So my new ellipse after saturation is significantly larger than the initial ellipse, ellipse size when I sent it into the plasma to begin with. Um, so I now have a larger volume in phase space, or in other words, my emittance has grown. This is bad. We want to prevent this. Why do we want to prevent this? Well, imagine taking my ellipse and rotating it so it's standing up straight vertically. The projection in x is telling me how small I can focus my beam in the x dimension, and I want to be able to focus it, focus it to a very small spot. That's what's going to increase the luminosity at the end of the day at the target um, for my collisions. I want to focus it to a very small, dense spot at the end of the day. Once it's saturated to this larger circular, emit, uh, circular ellipse, I can no longer focus it to a, s a small spot size that I could before. Here is a computational simulation by Robert Arnello, my student, my former student who's graduated, uh, showing this in a simulation where you can see the higher energy particles in red, the lower energy particles in blue. They rotate at different rates. And we can see the emittance grows constantly. Epsilon is the symbol we use for the emittance. It's growing constantly as the particle propagates. In this case, it almost triples by the end of the simulation. So how do we prevent this from happening? So first, we consider a beam that has a finite but small energy spread, 1%, which is typical. And we assume that the centroid energy slice is perfectly matched to our plasma. What that means is that in the normalized phase space, it is circular in shape to begin with. And then the other energy slices will only be slightly mismatched, or slightly non-circular, slightly ellipsoidal. So here we show, in a normalized transverse phase space, my matched beam would be perfectly circular. And then the other energy slices are almost circular. So as they all rotate together, the overall area basically doesn't grow, or it grows negligibly. So as my beam travels through the plasma, they all rotate clockwise still, but the saturated emittance is effectively the same as the initial emittance, and I've preserved the emittance of my beam. So I need to match my beam to the plasma. I need to make sure it has the correct phase space distribution when it enters the plasma. Here's another uh, simulation showing this, where you can't quite tell, but the blue particles and red particles are rotating at different speeds. But because they're all in the circular arrangement, the overall projected area doesn't grow. And the emittance stays roughly 5 micron radians in this case. OK, so how do we do this? Well, for a typical, typical plasma wake field accelerator, the matched spot size, the size the beam needs to be when it enters the plasma, is extremely, extremely small. In conventional, magnetic focusing devices actually struggle to achieve this spot size for these high energy beams. This is showing a cartoon with, say, maybe like a quadrupole focusing magnet focusing my bunches as they enter into the plasma. This is the plasma over here. Uh, so the solution that's been known for a while, at least in a hand-waving way, is to have a gradual plasma density ramp that catches the beam prior to entering the main part of the plasma where the acceleration happens. And the density is gradually ramped up and it adiabatically focuses these bunches from whatever size I can get at the start of the ramp to the appropriate tiny, tiny matched spot size at the start of the accelerator part of the plasma. So, the problem was, as I said, this was kind of understood in a hand-waving way, but the exact theory wasn't really that well developed or not sufficient for our needs. So one of the things we did first was to actually develop the analytic theory much more thoroughly. And I won't bore you with equations, but just show some nice plots from some papers we did where we can see our theory and simulations match pretty much exactly, showing the 
oscillation of the beam envelope as it's entering the plasma in the bad case where it's mismatched. And eventually, those oscillations damp out. That's representing this chromatic phase mixing, the saturation of the emittance growth that I was describing before. Here we can see the emittance growing and reaching saturation. This is just demonstrating that our theory works. But of course, once we understand the theory of how the emittance evolves, we can then uh, figure out what is the ideal plasma density profile to preserve the emittance in the manner I was describing before. So to create this plasma density profile, uh, it's tricky. So our method of generating the plasma is to have a vacuum chamber filled with gas, and then we shoot a laser pulse into it um, and focus the laser pulse just so to create a long filament. It's about a meter long with uniform density over that meter, and then these tapered density profiles on either end. Not easy to do. And the way we figured out how to do this was to create special custom diffractive lenses, nano-etched diffractive lenses, to provide a special focusing of our laser pulse. So here's Robert in the NanoFab lab working hard to create these uh, nano-etched diffractive lenses, where the idea is, here is the first lens. And we see what's being depicted here is a laser propagating from left to right. And this is sort of the intensity profile at each optic. And when it reaches the region of uh, long focal region, where it is to ionize the plasma. At the first lens, the incoming laser pulse is assumed to have just a flat top intensity profile distribution, as you would get from a typical high power laser system, like a Thai sapphire laser system. The first lens acts to then take that and reshape it into a donut-like intensity profile where when it reaches the second lens. The second lens removes the residual phase from the first lens and adds an axicon-like focusing phase, which is a like an axicon is a conical-shaped lens. So it adds an axicon-like focusing phase to produce this long focal region downstream. By shaping the intensity profile, we can shape the in longitudinal intensity profile. And then the axicon-like focusing gives us this long uh, focal region somewhere downstream, where we can then ionize gas and form our plasma filament. So this creates the ideal plasma density profile for beam matching and emittance preservation. So uh, we tested our optics in our lab here at CU. This is just showing some results of that test. The main point is that we had very good agreements with our simulations. Uh, an ideal performance from the, la from the uh, nano-etched nano optics. So the next big challenge comes with diagnosing this plasma source. This is a very weird, unique plasma source in the world of plasma physics. It's this long, it's like basically I took one of my hairs off of my head and pulled it out <laughs> and held it taut. It's roughly that kind of geometry, a few hundred microns wide, order meter long. And it's formed by laser ionization in a gas, and so it dissipates extremely quickly. First, it expands at the nanosecond time scale, and then it recombines maybe 100 nanosecond time scale, um, roughly speaking. And so trying to diagnose it is incredibly challenging. And if you try and put any kind of probe in there, it's going to interfere with the laser pulse that's propagating downstream to generate the plasma in the first place. So uh, really, plasma glow is one of the only easily accessible signals we have. And normal cameras, like a CMOS or Gigi, or sorry, a CMOS or a CCD camera, they integrate over hundreds of microseconds per shot, uh, per exposure, which is way longer than the lifetime of the plasma. So, uh, and the trigger jitter for these cameras is on the order of 10 microseconds, which is also way longer than the lifetime of the plasma. So to try and use these cameras to get sort of a nanosecond time-resolved image of what's happening with our plasma is very challenging. And that's what we'd like. That's the di dynamic time scale of this plasma dissipation. So one of my students, Valentina Lee, figured out a very clever method to utilize our cameras and a very, the very prompt, effectively instantaneous fiducial signal of our laser pulse that's creating the plasma in the first place. And then uh, by carefully diagnosing uh, the jitter profile of our camera, we could take hundreds or thousands of shots of our plasma over and over again and statistically reconstruct the time evolution of our plasma. So first we take hundreds of images of our plasma, and some fraction of those images are going to capture the plasma glow after it's already started. So we can then sort those images, time sort those images based on their brightness, assuming the brighter ones integrated over a longer time of roughly the 200 nanoseconds or so that the plasma glow exists. The duller images integrate, uh, start their integration, presumably at the end of the plasma glow lifetime. 
And then we can subtract one column from the next and get this time-resolved image of the plasma glow. And with 200 shots taken over the duration of the plasma glow, which is about 200 nanoseconds long, we get roughly nanosecond resolution uh, temporal imagery of our plasma glow with just these cheap little few hundred dollar cameras, which is pretty awesome. It's a very clever experimental technique. It allows us to compare our models and our simulations uh, and infer initial plasma par parameters from this simple diagnostic technique. So the plasma glow comes from two sources, electron neutral collisions, uh, collisional excitation, and uh, electron ion recombination. And so we crunched the numbers and found that, in fact, in our case, the glow is almost entirely dominated by the collisional process. And we were able to compare our model to our data and saw extremely good agreement of the time evolution of our plasma. We can see uh, even this sort of secondary bump feature appearing at an exa almost exactly the same time later, um, which was very encouraging. So then we even went further and found that we could model what does the peak intensity of the time integrated signal in a single photographic image of our plasma glow, how does that correspond to these initial plasma parameters like the density and temperature, which are the primary parameters of the plasma? We saw very good agreement once again with our model that we created and the data, at least so long as the laser was fully ionizing the gas um, along the central axis. So it allowed us to use just a single image now to infer initial plasma parameters after we've gained confidence in our model based on the clever time resolving technique uh, that Valentina came up with for our cameras. So uh, quickly, I wanted to introduce another concept that we've worked on called the thin underdense passive plasma lens. This is another tool to help us focus our electron bunch into the plasma accelerator to preserve the emittance. So to go through the name, it's thin, which means that it's like a plasma wake field accelerator that's much shorter than one beta drawn period, one oscillation in transverse phase space of our bunch. It's underdense, meaning it's in the nonlinear blowout regime. It's passive, meaning it doesn't rely on any externally driven current. And it's a plasma lens, which means that it's a plasma that acts like a lens to focus our electron beam with negligible energy change in the process. Here's a cartoon showing the scheme. I have this thin little sheet of plasma in this case with my drive bunch entering into the sheet. And then the sheet, in this case, at some later time, now has this uh, characteristic blowout pattern. So I've expelled a lot of plasma electrons from the center, creating this uh, naked ion channel in the middle that's then going to provide a sharp focusing impulse on the witness bunch, the trailing bunch that passes through it. And here's a particle and cell simulation of this process. So it's going to provide an ultra strong axisymmetric focusing. So as the plasma accelerator provides thousands of times stronger acceleration compared to conventional accelerator technology, the plasma lens here provides thousands, if not millions of times stronger uh, focusing force compared to conventional focusing techniques. So this is very useful for matching our electron beam into our plasma wake field accelerator. Uh, for example, if we have trouble getting exactly the right ramp shape in practice. So the status of our experiments at FACET2, um, we've installed our custom lenses that Robert designed. Here's uh, an engineering drawing of the experimental area where the electron beam passes through this pipe from left to right. Here's a photograph of the experimental chamber here where we've installed a ton of hardware. Uh, the first plasma formation has been demonstrated. So here's a kind of cruddy photograph, but it showed that we formed our plasma. <laughs> and uh, right now, uh, unfortunately, we don't have very interesting experimental results because FACET2 is still in the commissioning process. So COVID and uh, other major events at Slack National Lab, unfortunately, have delayed the commissioning of this facility by multiple years at this point. But we're finally wrapping up commissioning this year and expect in 2024 to get to the real experiments. We were able to do some commissioning of the plasma lens as well and send an electron beam through our plasma lens. Here are some photographs of different shots of the plasma lens. Uh, we weren't able to get it to perform as expected yet. This is just running the equipment and diagnostics for their paces. But we expect in 2024 we're going to finally begin our real experimental campaign, which is exciting. So uh, I'm going to go very fast now through this last topic which is the most speculative, but pretty interesting. This is democratizing X-ray lasers. So this idea of making compact X-ray laser sources at ultra high brightness. So the X-ray free electron laser is the heart of this part of the research. If I have a charged particle and I accelerate it, it produces radiation. If I have a relativistic charged particle and I send it through 
a series of alternating magnetic fields, dipole magnetic fields, the electrons are going to undulate back and forth, slalom back and forth. And they're producing synchrotron radiation when they do so. But thanks to the relativistic boost, that synchrotron radiation is uh, propagating almost entirely in the forward direction. So if I have this radiation and this undulating force, my electron bunch is also traveling at near the speed of light. So it's basically propagating right along with the x-rays it itself is producing. And the interaction between those x-rays and the electrons in the presence of this undulating field can result in the microbunching of this electron bunch. So here's the electron bunch. First, when it enters, all the synchrotron radiation is incoherent. But if I set up things just right, which takes you know, being very clever, I can get eventually uh, a microbunching of my beam, my electron beam, which results in these thin longitudinal bunches that are all themselves emitting the radiation coherently together. And the upside of that is now the radiation power is going to scale like the number of particles squared instead of the number of particles linearly. So if I have, say, 100 million particles in my bunch, now I have 100 million squared proportional power in the radiation, which is just an enormous scaling power. Right? This is a log plot showing just this enormous gain that you get from this microbunching. So this is a really uh, clever way of getting very high power, high brightness, high coherent, single wavelength light. And in fact, this method is the only way to produce the brightest x-ray pulses on Earth by orders of magnitude. Now, there are actually very small, inexpensive, compact, and efficient x-ray laser sources that are right here at CU. Uh, Henry Captain and Margaret Murnane's group use. Uh, I saw Henry earlier. Yeah, so Henry uses uh, lasers and plasmas to also create x-ray lasers. It's at a different scale. So these are useful for different purposes. Uh, this is really at the extreme high brightness, high energy scale. So if you want to get to this extreme high brightness scale, you need these relativistic electron bunches. And the advantages they have over conventional synchrotron light sources, which are incredibly popular, useful tools, are that the light's monochromatic, so I have narrow bandwidth, single wavelength light. It's ultra high brightness. Again, I told you about the scaling with the uh, uh, n squared number of particles. And it's ultra fast pulse duration, ultra short pulses, femtosecond long pulses. This is another very important feature of these light sources. And they enable science in all these different fields. And you know, interestingly, they can permit you know, what are effectively like movies of atomic and molecular processes. So they're incredibly impactful, and maybe they're arguably even more impactful than a future particle collider might be. Um, there are a number of facilities in the world, nine of them right now, with a few more coming in the near future. Uh, there's still not enough to meet demand, not by a long shot. So to give you an idea of the parameters, the wavelength range of these pulses is on the order of angst angstroms, so hundreds of nanometers. Uh, with most interest at the smaller scale here. With electron beam energies to produce these are on the order of 10 GeV energy per particle with tens of picocoulomb per charge in the bunch. And the energy spread of the electron bunches for these devices is 0.1%. That's actually very small. So this is the crux. This is the big challenge for plasma-based accelerator X-ray free electron lasers. So this energy scale, 10 GeV energy scale, means I need a one kilometer long accelerator and an undulator of maybe a few hundred, yard, few hundred meters long. So that's why there's only nine of them in the world, even though they're so amazingly powerful. They need a national laboratory to house these things and to pay for them. So we'd like to fix that by powering them with a plasma-based accelerator. Now, I'm not going to read all of these. This is just to show you these are the important parameters that go along with free electron lasers. The important one down here is the constraints on the beam emittance and the beam energy spread. The emittance has to be lower than roughly the Lorentz factor times the fundamental wavelength of your radiation that you're aiming for. And the energy spread, the relative energy spread, has to be less than rho. What is rho? This is the Pierce parameter. I'm not going to talk about what this is. The main thing is, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, the main thing is, this is the important parameter that kind of rules many of these other um, important parameters that describe the behavior of the free electron laser. This kind of rules everything. And one thing I will point out here is this is the Lorentz factor gamma of my electron beam. It goes like 1 over gamma to the third to the 1 third power. So it goes like 1 over gamma for my conventional free electron laser. And in fact, in 2021, we did finally demonstrate, by we I mean the community, demonstrated 
an electron beam from a laser driven plasma weak field accelerator lasing in the soft X-ray regime in a free electron laser. Here are some data where they showed the electron bunches they used and the corresponding spectra of the X-rays, soft X-rays they generated. This is by a group in Shanghai and published in Nature in 2021. Um, this is the first soft X-ray free electron laser powered by a plasma-based accelerator. And there were two other free electron lasers powered by plasma accelerators within the last few years, lasing in the UV and IR regime uh, but these results represent a major milestone for the field. So we're really, really in striking distance now of being able to um, power applications useful for other scientists in many fields based on plasma-based technology. But there's still a little gap to go. Um, 27 nanometer wavelength, that's like almost an order of magnitude more than what we'd like to get. And that energy spread is still really the challenging thing to try and defeat. So the ion channel laser uh, is our answer to that. So my group has been investigating this alternative method where we use, instead of a magnetic undulator to produce the oscillation, we use an ion channel. So if you remember our picture of the plasma wake field accelerator, where I have a drive bunch going into a plasma and expelling plasma electrons. Well, the idea is if I have a very narrow plasma, formed in the first place, and my drive bunch is very strong, I can expel the plasma electrons out to you know, infinity for all intents and purposes, leaving behind a naked ion column. The acceleration from the plasma accelerator comes from the current of the plasma electrons. And when they're not there, there's no longitudinal field. So I don't get any acceleration, which is good. I want my beams to be constant energy for the sake of producing this radiation. But I still have the focusing force. The focusing force comes entirely from the ion channel. So I get exactly what I want. I've got the focusing force without the acceleration. And if you remember, the focusing force is linear with R. That means it's going to produce a sinusoidal-like oscillation of my bunch if I send it in off-center, just like the way it would undulate in this magnetic undulator. So the idea is to have the strong drive bunch, a narrow plasma channel, create the wakeless ion channel, and then uh, send in my off-axis trailing bunch to undulate and produce x-rays. So we've done some pick simulations of the scheme. One interesting thing is that the micro-bunching, instead of creating these longitudinal little bunches like in the free electron laser, I get a micro-snaking that snakes at the period of the wavelength of the radiation. And uh, I can also even control the polarization of the radiation, which is unique compared to the free electron laser. Here's a plot showing some work done by my student, Claire Hansel, who has actually drove, driven all of this ion channel laser research I'm showing. And it shows the correlation between the electron bunch ellipticity, orbit ellipticity, and the radiation ellipticity. So I'm nearly done. I know I'm a little over time, but I'll wrap up in a couple slides here. Uh, the biggest difference between the ion channel laser and the free electron laser, here are these parameters. I'm not going to go over them. But the main thing is that the stronger focusing force inside the ion channel laser leads to a smaller beam size that's undulating back and forth. And that leads to a much larger Pierce parameter. It's roughly 10 times larger than that in the free electron laser, which means we get a great relaxation in this energy spread requirement that's so hard for plasma accelerators to reach right now. So it's basically trying to meet our plasma accelerators halfway. A 1% energy spread, we can achieve that now with uh, plasma-based accelerators. It also has a much shorter gain length, so the undulator is only meters long instead of hundreds of meters long. Uh, has a shorter cooperation length, slightly larger radiation bandwidth. This isn't great, but that's actually not a problem. It's not much larger, and the fraction's more significant. That's also actually not a problem. So overall, it looks very promising on paper. Here's some simulations that are preliminary done by Claire. This is actually very hard to simulate. Another area we're pushing in the research to be able to understand if this is going to work. What we're showing here is with a low current beam, this is the beam density profile, and we saw the plasma pass by. The beam looks basically the same before and after the plasma passes by. We're in the beam frame in this case. And in the beam frame over here, the plasma is passing by. What we're going to see is that there's going to be a modulation of my bunch that's in a higher current bunch, I see microsnaking. So this is telling me I'm in this high gain regime where I get this self-feedback loop that it is the micro bunching we expect in the ion channel laser mechanism. Uh, so, so it looks very promising, though it's preliminary and challenging. So we have experimental plans at FACET 2. We have all the ingredients there. And in fact, I've been waiting for a while for this because no other facility in the world has all of the correct ingredients to try and do this experimentally. And a lot of this is because it's very synergistic with the rest of our plasma accelerator plan, or our program. So we're going to try and do it in two phases, uh, ultimately trying to get, at least demonstrate it in the UV regime. 
So finally, to summarize everything, plasma wave field acceleration improves upon conventional accelerator technology by orders of magnitude in terms of the accelerating gradient, um, even the focusing force. Demands for future high energy physics colliders have been demonstrated individually. And now it's time to demonstrate them all simultaneously, which is roughly what we aim to do at FACET 2. Um, the first plasma-based accelerator applications are likely, however, to be compact, high-brightness X-ray light sources, not a uh, collider. That's going to be a few more decades down the road, at least. And that's been suc successfully demonstrated in some experiments already, but some challenges remain, and that's where we try to meet those challenges with the ion channel laser, which is a un unique device that's really never, never been explored in experiments before. So we're going to hope to demonstrate the first ion channel laser at FACET 2 sometime in the near future. And you know, this really scratches the surface of our experimental program. There's so many things you can do with lasers and plasmas and beams. We're really involved in many, many other experiments of FACET 2, but you know, it'll have to be for another time. We're already five minutes late. So here is the grand vision of my research, <laughs> as encapsulated by an SMBC comic some years ago. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for going a little late. OK, uh, we have time for a couple questions. I saw your hand first. That's a great question. The mean free path of the particles in the plasma accelerator, the ion channel, it's very long. So collisions do occur, of course, but on the length scales we care about, they're negligible. That's a great question, though. Mike, just could you tell us uh, a bit about what you know, the characteristics of the lasers that are used, just even in your sample one that you showed for the Berkeley experiment. I mean, you know, what yeah. sorts of pulse energies, timing, sure. uh, you know, you know, shortnesses, sure. wavelengths, things like that? Yeah, yeah. So um, for driving a plasma accelerator, you generally want at least a 100 terawatt or petawatt laser system. Uh, that's the peak pulse um, power. So these are generally tens of femtosecond pulses with you know, joule scale energy, 10 joule energy, higher. Uh, so extremely powerful laser pulses. So, uh, and it generally tends to be the higher uh, in peak power they go, the lower the repetition rate. So you know, petawatt laser systems are maybe like one hertz machines generally. The laser system I have here at CU is a 10 hertz, 10 terawatt laser system that we really use just for the plasma generation, not for driving the plasma wakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it aims, so to be honest with you, the details, you mean of the plasma accelerator, plasma collider design? Plasma collider design, it's fairly immature, but it started with like uh, basically a competitive Higgs factory luminosity and worked backwards from there to get specs for the machine design that would achieve that. I don't remember specific numbers, to be honest with you, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd say it was basically, I think, trying to uh, provide the same kind of luminosity. And most importantly, actually, is the luminosity divided by the operation power. That's the biggest figure of merit. And so this comes in with a competitive, in fact, slightly better luminosity per power. But it's a very immature design because there's still a lot of science yet to be worked out for the details to make that kind of a design work. It's more to just show the vision of what we hope to achieve. It's certainly not like a technical design report or even a conceptual design report at this stage. Yeah. So you have to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I kind of touched on it a little bit, but by talking about So question about repetition rate and how it's changed over time. So yeah, initially, you know, repetition rate wasn't even a concern. We're just trying to make the scheme work at all. Now repetition rate is of uh, greater importance. So high repetition rate hasn't really been demonstrated continuously yet for a couple reasons. One, laser-driven systems need these high power lasers. And high power lasers are infamously bad at high average power. So they operate at low repetition rates. And in fact, that's a major bottleneck for trying to have um, say, something like a collider based on laser-driven technology 
because the laser technology is not there yet. So we'd probably need a particle-driven technology for a collider-type design that really needs the high repetition rate. You don't necessarily need the high repetition rate or the extremely high repetition rate if you're just kind of trying to make like a university scale x-ray free electron laser, for example. 10 hertz would be amazing because your alternative is zero hertz. And uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of why it's uh, not a bottleneck for that application in particular. But yeah, um, uh, there are challenges, but it is definitely an active area of research. I think the goal is to try and hit, say, kilohertz for trying to get to these advanced application designs would probably be sufficient. And uh, the plasma technology is a part of that, trying to basically remove the heat at a fast enough rate and uh, let the plasma relax fast enough. But that looks promising now based on recent experiments. Yeah, what is the challenge? It's, it's now 5 o'clock, so I'm going to cut off uh, questions here. Um, but. I'm not going to let Mike leave until he answers all the questions if you want to come down afterwards. Uh, so let's thank the speaker one more time.